Facebook Live, where each week we have the chance to speak with my guest experts about best practices for guiding the breast cancer treatment journey. A breast cancer diagnosis means there will be many decisions ahead, and finding the path that's personally right is daunting, even when the patient has a medical background. That's what our guest today, Dr. Kathleen Thompson, an MD herself and author of the book From Both Ends of the Stethoscope, found when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I'm Faz Seeker, the president and CEO of Molly Surgical. Kathleen worked as a medical doctor in the NHS in the UK for many years and now works in the pharmaceutical industry in new medicine development. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011. And despite being an MD, she struggled to understand what was happening and how to challenge the system when things weren't feeling right. It made her realize how much harder it must be for people without a medical background. She said that getting cancer gave her insight into what it's like to have life-threatening illness. So just before we go ahead and get started, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we're live. So go ahead and join us. Comment below with your thoughts and questions for Kathleen. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to ask you first, if I may, um, about how you first discovered your cancer. Well, I mean, that's an interesting and quite important question, Priscilla, because it, 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 I think it illustrates that it's not always straightforward. I did not feel a lump. Um, I mean, the cancer was the last thing on my mind. And after having a shower one morning, I just glanced in the mirror and saw a, just kind of a, a redness on, on one of my breasts. And um, I looked at it and something deep inside even then said, that isn't right. But I just thought, oh, it's probably just the hot water from the shower. So I left it. Then I noticed over the next week that this, this redness was still there and it was always in the same place. And um, again, um, you know, I did all the things that I would tell a patient not to do. I, I procrastinated. I found a hundred reasons why it might be there and I didn't do anything. And it wasn't until I eventually I went along um, to have um, a bra fitted that the girl who was fitting the bra was struggling to get one side to fit. And it was this same side. And this just made me think, Something's not right. So I went to my, my primary care physician, my general pr practitioner, and um, he couldn't feel a lump. And um, he said, well, you know, it's, it's probably nothing, but I'll send you to the, the breast unit um, and you'll hear from them within a couple of weeks, which I did. So I went along and um, within an hour, I'd had a mammography, I'd had ultrasound, I'd had a biopsy, and I'd been told that I probably had cancer. So it was really not what I was expecting and quite a shock. And I think it does, you, you know, it, it does illustrate the point that if something's not wrong with your breasts, you probably know that that's not normal for you. And don't be put off going to your doctor or, you know, people thinking that you're being neurotic because anything is worth checking out, even if there is no lump there. Do you feel like being a medical doctor uh, better prepared you in any way for the diagnosis? Yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that obviously I'd got the knowledge, I'd got the familiarity with a hospital setting, which was important, but in another way, completely not. I was kind of like a... A, a gibbering idiot in some ways. Um, I think what we can't underestimate is what um, state of shock you go into with this sort of diagnosis. I mean, cancer has deep-seated fear within us, um, not always justified, I have to say, and a lot of cancers are treatable, but nevertheless, we hear the word cancer and we think the worst. And so, no, I, I would go into the the... Um, hospital outpatients, I would be in a state of shock. I, fortunately, on the second time onwards, I did take somebody with me and they made notes. I'd read the notes straight after coming out of the outpatients appointment and I wouldn't recognize anything that had been said. I was just taking in nothing, and which was quite a surprise to me as a doctor because I had no idea how little patients and their relatives do take in when you talk to them and that was quite a learning for me so uh, in some ways yes but in some ways no you're still a patient and you still feel very very vulnerable I mean things did go wrong with my care little things um, which you know often do go wrong for people 
I found it just as hard to stand up to the doctor as anybody else because that person in my psyche was the person with control of my life or death and you don't want to upset them. And, you know, again, it's a deep psychological feeling. And so in many I've often heard, I've often heard it's, a, it's like you go into trauma and you just go into that fight or flight mode. Yes, I think that's a, a very valid description, really. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like your medical knowledge was a positive or a negative throughout your breast cancer experience? You alluded that things went wrong and, and you had difficulty standing up to your physician. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it certainly did and, in, in, did. and in fact, I think one of the things that inspired me to write the book was um, thinking, well, if I'm struggling with all my medical background, how hard is it for somebody who, who doesn't know anything about hospitals or medicine? Mm -hmm. And it's a confidence thing as well, because even though I struggled to fight my corner when things were being done which I knew weren't right, and I really did struggle, but I thought, at least I know in my heart of hearts that this is incorrect, medically speaking. Some Somebody else without that knowledge might well end up thinking, well, no, I'm obviously wrong, the doctor must know best, and, and wouldn't fight it, and could end up getting the wrong treatments, which I nearly did. So mm -hmm. I think, it, yes, it definitely did help, um, but it's, it's not a, a kind of a, you know, a gold card either. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't get you through everything. Yeah. In one of your published articles, Kathleen, I was reading that you struggled with making a decision about your surgery and treatment plan, and, and you're um, giving us some insight into that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what specifically was challenging for you? What advice do you give others in this position that don't have your medical background? Well, I mean, there were various stages along the treatment plan where, where, um, things probably weren't as they should be, but the first one really was when it had, I'd had this initial redness on my breast. It got as far as yes, you've got cancer, but mm -hmm. then even that wasn't straightforward. So I had to go back week after week for more and more tests. So when it came to the point that I was there discussing the surgery with the surgeon, it had already been quite a few weeks and your natural fear is, you know, this cancer is just growing and growing inside me. I've got to get it out tomorrow. You know, I don't want to have any more holdups. I would just say, incidentally, that that is not necessarily a rational fear. Cancers actually grow quite slowly and it's far more important to make the right decision and take the time than rush into the wrong decision. That's a terrific point. I just want everybody to take that in, right? Can you just say that once again? Absolutely. Um, we all think that cancers grow very quickly. In fact, cancers cancers work by doubling because the cells double. So one becomes becomes two, two, two becomes four. So when it's small, if it's the size of a pea, it will double to the size of two peas in a few days or whatever. Um, that is not really much difference. When it comes very big, like the size of an orange, in that same period of time, it will double to the size of two oranges. So eventually, of course, it does appear to grow quite fast. But in the early stages, it's actually growing quite slowly and you have time on your side and it's so important to make the right decision first of all to do the investigation so you know exactly what you're dealing with and then to make the right decision particularly with breast cancer because there are two elements of breast cancer obviously the, there is making sure you don't die which is primary but also, you know, the breast is an important part of the female anatomy. And even for the, for men with breast cancer, you know, there is the, is the um, appearance side to consider. And particularly for the female breast cancer, there are many different operations with different cosmetic outlooks. And if you've got to live with that for the rest of your life, um, you might as well end up with the best cosmetic outcome, particularly if you're a younger woman, but even for older women, it, it matters. And um, so it's important to go, not delay, but not panic either, I would say. So I just want um, for our viewers to really take that in. And if you just liked what you heard, take the time, don't rush into a decision. You have time um, at that early stage of cancer diagnosis. Don't rush into a decision. If you, if you like what you just heard, please give us a share or a like. I really want everybody uh, to hear that message.
and know that it's more important to take the time to make the right decision for you than rush into something. You actually do have time. It's it's not, um, you know, it's not a decision you need to make uh, this week or tomorrow. So Kathleen, if we can go back, you were telling us about some of the challenges that you faced throughout the course of your treatment plan and, and kind of specifically what you found challenging. Yeah, so I mean, in, in summary, the, the problem when eventually I was told, um, right, we can now decide on the operation, I was already in a state of panic. I just wanted to get on and do, it, do anything. And the surgeon then started giving me options. One option was a mastectomy. Another, you know, where the whole breast is removed. Another option was to remove the lump, which was quite a big lump. And eventually I would need the breast on the other side making smaller. Mm -hmm. um, now, it was not a perfect consultation. I mean, the surgeon was great, but she was running about three hours late. Um, she was clearly exhausted, um, whatever. And I felt she was explaining things very, very quickly and not necessarily making a lot of sense. Now, I'm a doctor, but I wasn't an expert at the time in breast cancer. I've become a, much more of a, an expert since. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wasn't understanding what the pros and cons of the different operations were. And in the end, in desperation, I said to her, well, what would you do if you were in my shoes? And bless her, she said, and I know she said it very sincerely, but I'm not in your shoes. You've got to make the decision. And, yeah. you know, I kind of was left in that situation, like, you know, the plumber's saying to you, you know, what kind of Spanish should I use here? And it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I just don't know. And um, in the end, I can tell you, I came out of that meeting. I'd made a decision with my fingers crossed behind my back, thinking, well, I hope this is the right decision, but I don't really know. Um, now, things progressed on um, through my story, and I did end up getting the operation I, uh, that was best for me. But it was quite shocking that, you know, you've got all this expertise. I was um, being offered very expensive operations, very good medical care. And yet, I wasn't on board with the decision, and I really was not convinced it was the best decision. And actually, it would not have been the best decision, as I discovered later. So why is that? Tell us a little bit more about that. Why so, I mean, there were specific, there were lots of, it's strange because it was almost like somebody up there was deciding I was going to write a book because there were all these strange situations happened which you almost couldn't make up. But this particular one was that there were one surgeon down at the hospital, so they were very short-staffed and it was really hard even fitting me in for an operation, which was another mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, but they wanted to do in the end, I decided on the mastectomy and they said, OK, well, we'll give you an implant. Now, for a lady of my not so young years, an implant is not usually a good option because it's quite a different shape from the other breast, which, you know, shows the signs of gravity over time. Mm -hmm. And so it looks very uneven even, and it just doesn't look right. Um, but the operation which at the time I was really wanting was the um, the one involving plastic surgery is called a, a DF reconstruction where they take part of the fat from your tummy right. and, and they reconstruct um, the, the breast with that. But that wasn't a plastic surgeon available. And instead of saying, as really she should have done, I can refer you to a plastic surgeon, she didn't offer me that. So mm -hmm. I was left with this less than perfect operation and I just didn't know what to do, frankly. Right. And so this is um, a great segue into the next topic I wanted to um, talk with you about, shared decision making. How should this conversation look? Uh, we're hearing what didn't go right. How should it have gone? And what should a patient do if they don't feel right about how things are going? Right. And well, I think that's, I mean, there's two ways of looking at it. I mean, there's kind of the responsibility of the medical staff and, and there's what can the patient do. Right. In some ways, you, you can't help the medical staff that you get to a large extent in, in the first instance anyway. I mean, you can change them. But, um, and, and, you know, medical staff are trying their best. Um, most of them 
hope to do the best job. They care, they're going to the profession because they care about people. Um, they don't always do a perfect job. They don't always hit it off with a certain person. Communication is not always perfect, etc., etc. So this is not a criticism of them. But I think what is most helpful is to look at what you can do as a patient because that is the one thing that you have control of. So I think the important thing, and these are a lot of these are things which I didn't do, is as I say, and I'll say it again, um, don't panic, you do have time. Better to start again with another doctor if you're really not getting on with that one. And that's possible. I know in the US you can you can go um, quite easily to another doctor. Even in the NHS in the UK, you can ask for a second opinion, and that is a very acceptable thing to do. I think um, there's an element of self-worth, which... Again, particularly the British are very bad at, you know, we apologise for complaining about everything. Um, but I think what I noticed throughout my care, and this is diverging a little bit, but when I was in hospital and everywhere, the people who got the best care were not the nice people who sat and smiled and said, don't worry, that's fine. The people who got the best care were the people who were really very demanding in an unapologetic way. And I think that is very important and something that a lot of people have to learn, particularly when they're feeling in this vulnerable position where they've got a nasty, potentially fatal illness and they're depending on, on the people in, in on the other side of the table. So you have to have self-work and you have to feel that you want to come out of this with what you want. You know, you know that you have got time, so you, you mustn't rush. You must sit on that seat as if you're glued to it until you absolutely understand. You must not worry if the doctor seems hurried or they're trying to hurry you out the door. You must sit there until you really understand. And um, and then you must go home. And despite the fact you don't feel like it, you must read around the subject. I mean, the internet is a fabulous resource. There are lots of very good books out there and you do need to make yourself read. It's hard. And if, if you can't do it yourself, you need someone close to you, a friend or a relative um, who will help you with it. But you need to be informed because that is absolutely important. If you go home and you think, I really didn't understand that or I've said something and now I regret it. You don't feel guilty. You phone back. If necessary, have another appointment or speak on the phone and say, I've changed my mind. I don't want to do that or I want to discuss it again. And these are like simple, obvious things, but they're really not obvious when, when you're sitting yeah. there and you're in that situation. And I'm going to come back and, and just challenge you a little bit, if I may, because earlier we uh, talked about how uh, when you're diagnosed with that breast cancer, you're not thinking straight, right? It's like you're in your flight mode. And so when you're in that state of shock, you can't yeah. think straight, you can't absorb information. And yet we're we're right now talking about you got to stand up for yourself as a patient yeah. to get the best care. So how can you do that when you can't even think clearly? How do you get out of that really? brain? Well, absolutely. And I mean, that is, is the situation. Um, I think somebody telling you that you have to do these things is one thing, which is why I'm telling people, um, you know, you actually need to be almost shocked into, look, you have to do this. And from my own experience, it is a process. I mean, yeah. on the day one, when I was in there, I couldn't have, have made any decision to save my life. But then you do go through, with the shock, you do go through a, a, a period where suddenly you start to think, hang on, look, you know, I can't rely on, on the medical staff. I've got to look into this myself. And at that time, I think at that time, it's very important not to think, oh, gosh, but I've already committed to this. I think you still have the option of changing your mind then. I mean, to be honest, some people appear to naturally do it anyway. They just seem to be naturally more um, demanding and um, assertive. That's not everyone. Right, that's not everyone. No, exactly. Um, but you have to le learn from it. Um, and yes, you're in state of shock. I mean, I think the only other thing that you can really do is have somebody else there. I think that's important because somebody else will listen and hear things that you don't hear. They will write things down um, so that you can go and check afterwards what was really said and not what you think was said. Um, and also, I think they are more prepared to stand up for your rights sometimes than you are because they are objective. They're not in the firing line. And they can um, say, well, hang on a minute, what about this? But I think, again, the important thing is 
when you probably are going to start thinking straight is once you've left the consulting room. And that's when you absolutely must remember, I can change my mind. It's my life. It really matters. And to be fair, the medical staff will understand it. You know, you kind of think, oh, no, they're going to get so annoyed with me. No, they don't. They want to do the best job for you. And so what if they get annoyed with you? It's <laughs> your body, it's your life, right? Absolutely. You really have to live with the consequence. So what if they do get angry? Go find another doctor. <laughs> No, and you're absolutely right. But that is a hard absolutely struggle for a lot of people because I see this psychological perception that they're in control of your life and death, you know, which actually they're not. But you know, I'm gonna, back, I'm gonna go back to that wonderful piece of advice that you had and I'm gonna ask you to repeat it again. What was it? <laughs> um don't panic. Yes, yes, don't panic. You have time. I mean, obviously, you don't want to waste time, but you have time. I, just given my experience, having gone through all this, several weeks of investigations, desperate for my operation, what actually happened in the end was I was forced to start again with another doctor. And I did that, and I ended up with a much better outcome and actually probably had the operation at the same time I would have done if I'd stayed with the first one. So yeah. you must strive to get the best care. It's so important. How long did you wait, Kathleen, before you could write your own story and how was that for you emotionally? As I mentioned before, it's a strange thing because I had a very strong feeling from as soon as this all started that I'd been given cancer for a reason. I know it sounds crazy, but I really felt that I had to write a book to help others mm -hmm. because, you know, I had the benefit of medical knowledge. A lot of people were struggling and there were so many basic things which I could help with. And so I actually made notes all the way through my treatment, which I was quite glad of because otherwise I would have, things would have got very confused in my mind because as I say, I wasn't in, a, a, you know, I wasn't thinking straight some of the time. And so I made notes for all the way through. Um, I wanted to do a proper job with the book because, Again, it's hard. Many people write their stories of cancer and it's very interesting and obviously it's particularly important to them. But I felt that whereas, you know, it might be mildly interesting for complete strangers to hear what happened to me, mm -hmm. I wanted to give them more than that. And so I actually went on a writing course because, though I, you know, I do write regularly in my research work. I'd never written anything um, like a book before. And it's quite interesting the things I learn, like, um, you know, you can't just write facts. You actually have to put your emotions into it, which was a, a novel thing for me. Um, but so the whole process took a, a long time because I went on the writing course. I learned from some amazing people like the author Margaret Graham how to um, write properly. And then I needed to think, how can I get this book across? So that people who are in a state of shock, whose attention span is, you know, minutes at the most, how they can get all this vast amount of information that they need in an easy, easily digested fashion. And so what I did in the end was I, I divided the book into chapters so you can just pick out the chapters that are relevant to you at the time. You don't need to start at the beginning to work all the way through. Mm -hmm. Each chapter is purposely short, it's got some factual information and it's also got a little bit of my story to kind of give you the knowledge in an easy to digest way that at the end of the chapter there's a summary and then there's some further information sources which are also available on my website if, if you know if you want to look at them and you don't yeah, want we'll to post the links afterwards. Okay. Um, and, and so the whole thing took a few years um, to get to the final stage, um, but I felt happy with the format in the end. And this is your book from both ends of the stethoscope, correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how do people get access to it? Is there um, a link that we can share? It's on Amazon, yes, on Amazon um, UK and also Amazon.com. So it, it, you can get it on Kindle or you can get a hard copy, whichever you prefer. Great. Okay. So we'll we'll have the information after the show so people can easily find it. Um, just as we're coming up to the end here, uh, Kathleen, who were your biggest sources of support throughout your journey? And what resources do you suggest for people living with breast cancer? Okay. I mean, well, 
in the book, I do, you know, I do point you to a lot of websites and, and books which were helpful to me. Um, I would say, though, to be honest, the biggest sources of help to me were um, my my friends and relatives who got me through it. And I know that sounds crazy, but, you know, you do need somebody to help. You, you know, you can't be an island in this. I will also just mention one book, though, which um, is by a lady called Jo Taylor, ABC. Oh, yeah, we've had Jo on the show before. Oh, yeah. have you? Oh, well, great, because I, as you know, she's just fabulous, and she is somebody who's got secondary breast cancer, and she's produced this book, which has so much information in that. You know, I would say that was probably the, the best thing to go to. You can get it free from her or um, you download it on Kindle. And yeah, it's we so it. yeah. sources to go to. That's terrific. That's great to hear. So we'll go ahead and repost the link to that um, Joe's resource as well, and um, and the information about your book from both ends of the stethoscope. I think that's just a, a fabulous contribution to the community. Everybody has a different personal experience, and just finding the right experience to relate to um, is is part of it. So um, that is all the time that we have for the episode today. Were there any last thoughts that you wanted to share with our viewers, Kathleen? No. Uh except just to say I think you're doing a fabulous job too with it with these things I mean this is just such a great way to get the message out to people and the thing is I put the effort into writing the book but if people don't know about it I can't help them you know and um, there, there is a lot of good information out there and and when people are in the state of shock again it's hard for them to find it so I think something like this where people can just listen and, and learn is is a very good way of absorbing information. So well done, you guys, and thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, and we're happy to help get the word out. Um, I also am going to close out with some fabulous advice um, that you gave today, and I think the most important one to start out with is don't panic. You have time to make the right decision for your body, for your breast cancer, for yourself. And so once again, thank you so much, Kathleen, for joining us today. Um, I would like to invite everyone to tune in again next week on Tuesday for another episode of Breast Practices. Remember that you can sign up for notifications so that you'll never miss an episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye now.